Many are wondering in the coming time of trials upon the earth if there will be refuges, places of physical or spiritual protection, or is all that just fiction? We answer that next on Countdown to the Kingdom. Hi, I'm Mark Mallett from the NowWord.com and Countdown to the Kingdom.com. Well, before we dive into refuges, first of all, we want to address this whole idea of the rapture. That's right, the idea that Christians all over the world will be taken up into heaven before the trials and preserved from them. Well, to address this subject with me is Professor uh, Daniel O'Connor from Albany, New York. And Daniel, I... I uh, Daniel? Daniel, are you... Oh... Sorry, I just dropped my pen. Oh man, I thought you were uh, thought you were raptured there for a second. I wasn't okay. Okay, uh, that, yeah. that's cheesy. Yeah. We totally Sorry. set it up. Not not at all set up. No, 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 <laughs> folks, we're on a cheap budget. Please, you know, give us cut us some slack here. Some slack. But <laughs> well, it's it's good to have you back on the show. Actually, good to be here after for a real. quick quick rapture <laughs> to the <laughs> floor. Quick rapture break. <laughs> that's right. But, you know, this subject actually is quite serious, and uh, many Christians are still expecting this idea any day now that they're going to be raptured. I, I can actually, actually I remember in 1993, uh, Dr. Jack Van Impey, who had an end-time show, it was very prevalent in the 90s, you know, saying, I think it's this year, 1993, and then here we are, of course, uh, 27 years later. And there's I vividly all... recall 20, 2011, you know, uh, many of... Many of you will remember the viral sensation of the rapture coming then, and obviously it didn't. And look, we know that there's been plenty of, of prophecies that have failed in all circles within Christianity, but this particular one about the rapture is very problematic because it is completely misguided. That's right. And the fact that it hasn't happened yet doesn't you know, necessarily mean that it, it, it's not going to happen. In fact, we want to tell you it is going to happen. There is going to be a rapture, but not when people think. So... First of all, there, the word rapture is not in the Bible, um, but... Yeah, it, it, you won't find the word rapture anywhere in the Bible, and, you know, I mean, you won't find the word trinity in the Bible yeah. either, so we're not pretending that that proves anything, that the word rapture is not in the Bible, but it does, you know, raise a, a bit of a red flag, certainly. It is this idea of what the rapture is referring to is scripturally based here in in uh, Thessalonians here, the first Thessalonians, this is uh, chapter 4, verses 15 to 17. And it reads, For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangels called the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So there's, there's no passage. question then. Right, there's no question then that there is going to be a rapture. But this isn't what evangelicals mean when they speak of a rapture. What they're talking about is not an end time event. And that clearly is at the end. They're talking about something that takes Christians out of the coming trials. Right. But Daniel, this, this scripture it refers to the very end of the world. And if you look at our timeline, once again, we do not see Christ returning in the flesh as that scripture speaks of. He comes himself until the very end and the second coming in the flesh. And it makes, yeah, and the evidence for that is right within the verse itself, where it says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. And then it says that we will be with the Lord forever. So we have three separate points here proving that this is a reference to the end of time. The Lord himself implies a personal coming that is a physical coming, a literal physical coming in the flesh visibly, the Lord himself coming from heaven. And to assert that that could happen within time, that would be millenarianism, which of course is a heresy. So we have to go nowhere near that. So the mere fact that millenarianism is a heresy, this idea that Jesus will visibly, physically reign on earth, that in and of itself proves that this passage in Thessalonians is not referring to a rapture to save, to uh, protect the remnant from chastisements. God has a way in mind to protect the remnant from chastisements, but not the rapture. 
That's right. And it also contradicts other scriptures where Jesus says uh, in John chapter 15, no slave is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. In fact, in John chapter 17, verse 15, Jesus says, I do not ask, he's praying to the Father right now, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So right there, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm not asking you to rapture them out of the world mm -hmm. for, for trials, but that you keep them from the evil one. Yeah, God is, you know, he has ways to protect us without just physically lifting our bodies up into the clouds. Do you really think God needs to resort to that? He, he's he's like a surgeon. He, he can orchestrate the tiniest details of circumstances. He is going to protect us. Yes, that's a big part of his plan, protecting mm -hmm. a faithful remnant for the era. But he doesn't need to physically pick us up into the clouds to do that. Right. And we're going to share with you a scripture about Jesus' promise of protection for his people during the time of trial. But before we do that, just briefly, and then we'll move on to refuges, we want to explain the history of the rapture just very briefly. And it came from John Nelson Darby. This was an Anglican priest turned fundamentalist. And this concept that Darby put forward was picked up by uh, C.I. Schofield. It was put into the Schofield Reference Bible in the footnotes. But listen, folks, this whole concept of a pre-tribulation rapture was never heard of for the first 1,800 years of Christianity until Darby came up with this concept. It is not a concept in the early church. It is not a concept in the Catholic church. It's not a Catholic doctrine. As Daniel just read, the rapture will happen, but at the very end of time when we will meet the Lord in the air and we will be with him from that point forward. And there are no authentic private revelations promising this. That's we've right. Studied, we've studied many. Yeah. You won't find any authentic seers prophesying a rapture in the, in the fundamentalist sense of the word. That's right. That's an excellent point. There is no authentic or credible Catholic prophecy, not a single one that speaks of a coming pre-tribulation rapture. However, there are plenty of... Uh, seers in the Catholic Church who have spoken about God's protection, refuge over his people. With that, Daniel, why don't we begin with Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. And again, folks, we are referring, we are, this whole webcast series that Daniel and I are doing re is regarding this timeline that you can see uh, on, on your screen. This is at countdowntothekingdom.com. And this whole timeline is based on the book of Revelation and the seven seals and then what follows after and we have laid it down with the analogy of a great hurricane and a great storm. And Jesus says that when we get into the height of these trials, uh, particularly the last part of the storm, I'm guessing, he says this, and Daniel, you can read that in Revelation chapter 3.10. So, we, so Revelation chapter 3.10, we see because you've kept my word of patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial which is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. So a trial is coming, and yet protection from it is also promised to those who have kept his word. Jesus promises, he says, I will keep you safe. That doesn't mean he's going to rapture us. I mean, we, we have all kinds of examples in the sacred scriptures, Daniel, of God protecting his people, whether it was the Israelites in the desert, you know, there was a, a pillar of fire that he put between the, the Egyptian yeah, this army. isn't new for God. He's been, he's been doing this for a while, protecting his people from chastisements. He knows how to do it. <laughs> That's right. And for, I, I guess, why don't we just highlight just a few scriptures right now that we have, yeah. we've come up with. Uh, and again, we're just going to, we have so much we want to share with you in this, uh, this webcast. I, I hope we can get through it. <clears throat> I hope we can get through it. But, but I mean, the first place of refuge that we find in sacred scripture is the Noah's Ark. And this was a physical mm -hmm. refuge. I mean, you know, God protected him. He didn't say to Noah, I'm going to rapture you into the sky. I'm going to flood the earth. No, he, he provided him. He used, it, used what was available on earth, wood and so on. And he built an ark and God kept him safe. Um, 
another example would be in the book of Maccabees. And unfortunately, I think Luther hacked this book from the Protestant Bible, but the Catholics have always had it since the canon of Scripture was formed back in the 4th, 5th century. Um, you have the Israelites being persecuted, and it says that Israel was driven into hiding wherever places of refuge could be found. So God was keeping them in places of refuge. Um, You have Joseph, of course. Joseph was awoken by an angel. He had a dream, and the Lord commanded him to go into the desert. And God provided refuge from Herod for Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Um, We were talking about St. Paul just before the webcast. Uh, St. Paul was being persecuted. The Jewish leaders were plotting his murder. It says that they were watching the gates of the city day and night in order to murder him. But his disciples took him one night and let him down through the city wall by lowering him in a basket. God can do that for all of us. Yeah, because that that was the first basket case. So (laughs) if if you're... If you're, sorry, Saint Paul, it's just it's just a joke. But so if if you're so you, God has His basket prepared for you, and you know you mentioned Joseph. My goodness, our Old Testament Joseph, a whole a whole nation was turned into a, a refuge from a famine coming upon the land. So right. God is very capable of these things, and they are not exactly without precedent. So we shouldn't be surprised that this is part of His plan for mm-hmm. the coming times. Now. Although we do firmly believe this, we think it's, there's plenty of precedent in Scripture. We think that it makes logical sense, and we think we, we see that authentic private revelations have spoken of it. This doesn't change the fact that it is not what's really important, is it, physical refuge? Because infinitely, you know, p- infinitely more important, not even close, is that you are taking spiritual refuge in the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. That is your only real refuge. So don't ever let yourself be distracted one iota from that by pondering physical refuges. The preeminent word, I guess I would call it, for this idea that the Immaculate Heart of Mary is our refuge comes right from Fatima, where Our Lady herself said, My Immaculate Heart is your refuge and the way which leads you to God. Now, Mary doesn't do anything that Jesus doesn't tell her. Mary is in heaven. I think every Christian, evangelical, Protestant, Orthodox, whoever's watching this, believes Mary's in heaven. Of course she is. She Muslims, was. Muslims believe that too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah believe me. Hey, I remember. I, I remember this one Muslim cab driver. I met him, and he was so. This is a side story, but he was so angry at Americans and you know he's driving me to the airport and this guy was like he wanted to kill them and it was I thought man Homeland Security wants to know about this guy so I decided to change the subject and I said to him I said you know do you do you Muslims really believe in in Mary and he he just softened he goes Mm. oh she's the most beautiful of women she is the mother of Jesus she is the most holy one I was stunned by it And there's a whole other story about that. I've written about it. But the point is that Mary is definitely in heaven, and she would never be sent by Jesus to the earth to say, I'm your refuge, as, as, you know, preempting Jesus in some way. (laughs) This is, yeah, I mean, the the idea that there could ever be any sort of distraction from Jesus by Marian devotion, this makes no sense at all. They are always together. You can never separate them. Going to Jesus is always going to bring you to Mary. Going to Mary is always going to bring you to Jesus. Now, you know, I think a Catholic realizes that going to Mary is going to bring them to Jesus. Uh, A Protestant might not realize that going to Jesus is going to bring them to Mary, but it is because they're always together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I won't share this a long quote here, but I can't help but share a brief snippet here of what Jesus told the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, on uh, May 28th, 1937, that This is actually, sorry, what Our Lady told Louisa. My daughter, I am always with Jesus, but sometimes I hide within him, and it seems that he does everything. Hmm. While I am inside of him, I concur with him. I am aware of what he's doing. Other times he hides within his mother and lets me operate, but he is always concurring along. Other times both of us reveal ourselves together. And then the quote goes on for a while, but the point is they're always together. So if you ever find yourself asking, well, what should I do? Should I be devoted to Our Lady or should I be devoted to Jesus? Should I pray to one or the other? And the answer to that is don't ask stupid questions. <laughs> that, that's a stupid question. There are stupid questions and that's one of them because they never distract from each other. Be completely in love with both. 
that's that's right. She's she's so close to Jesus. She's right there, and uh, so yeah, it's not a competition. Um, it's like your own family. I mean, if you have a father and you have a mother, uh, sometimes you go to your mom. Sometimes you go to the dad. I mean, sometimes I find myself talking to the heavenly Father. Other times I'm talking to Jesus. Sometimes I'm calling out to the saints. Some, and, you know, often speaking to our blessed mother. It's because we're a family. You know, this idea that you can only talk to Jesus, you can only go to Jesus, is really something that, um, it, it's not a Catholic idea. And you'll find in the early catacombs, they were already drawing icons of Our Lady and Jesus, showing them together, as you said so beautifully, Daniel. Our Lady said, my immaculate heart is your refuge. So the first thing we want to point out is that the refuge that God is promising in Revelation chapter 310, this safety is first and foremost, is it is spiritual safety. When Jesus says, I'm going to keep you safe, his first promise in this is to keep you safe from deception. It's to keep you safe from falling away. It's to keep you safe from the wrath of God. And why I say that, uh, turning to John chapter 3, verse 10, and in the last webcast I re read to you, for God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him, may not perish but have eternal life. But you know, we need to quote the rest of that chapter. At the very end in verse 36, it says, anyone who believes in the Son has eternal life. This is Jesus talking. But anyone who refuses to believe in the Son will never see life, but is under God's wrath. And so what I'm saying here is that Jesus is saying, if you believe in me, if you have faith, if you follow me, if you repent, if you return to me, you are utterly safe. I mean, we don't have to right. go through this life Lately. questioning whether we're saved. You know, I mean, there's a certain humility in going, you know, there's a certain hubris maybe in saying, I'm saved, I'm always saved. Of course there is. St. Paul said, I work out my salvation with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling, right. But he Which also doesn't mean that you're going. doubting it. It just means that you realize it's a work in progress. You don't go just saying, once saved, always saved, I can do whatever I want. I have 100% certainty of everything. No. So it's a process that you continue with fear and trembling, but also with absolute trust and hope. Hope is a supernatural virtue. That means there's no vice of excess. You can't be too hopeful. You can't have too much confidence in God. So be completely sure that if you are taking refuge in God, you already are in your refuge. If you are in the will of God, you are completely safe. If you're not in the will of God, the best physical refuge on earth is useless for you. And this is put so well by a couple quotes from a, uh, some private revelations that we find credible. And um, I would love to share uh, just one sentence here from Luz de Maria. This is from January 5th, uh, January of 2015. This is a volume that bears an imprimatur, by the way. It was, I, I believe this is Our Lady speaking to her. In various countries, my children have created their own material refuge, but if they haven't created their internal refuge beforehand, they will suffer the same pain of those who threw me out. So if you get fixated on this idea that, okay, hard times are coming. I got to build a refuge. I got to mm. do, I got to get all this arsenal and years of food. And I'm going to, and if you do that, and then first of all, you shouldn't do that at all, unless you have been directly called by God to build a refuge. We are not standing here telling you to build a refuge. Right. That is only for you to do if God has clearly told you to. And he probably hasn't for most of you. Um, so, what Luz de Maria is being told here by heaven is that it would have been better if you didn't even start looking into this at all. If you're going to go being fixated on the idea of a material refuge and neglect your interior, the interior component, your soul. Right. And Father Michel uh, put it so perfectly as well. Do you want to read that quote? What do you want me to? Yeah, I, I want to read that, but I just want to just kind of capsulate what you're saying there is divine mercy. Exactly. Divine mercy. The mercy of Jesus is our refuge. Uh, without divine mercy, Our Lady can't do anything. Without divine mercy, it doesn't matter how holy you are. Divine mercy is what unites us to the Father, which is what reaches out to us and which saves us. So, once again, Jesus said, whoever believes in him. And St. Paul, by the way, those of you who are watching, when we say believe in Jesus, I said in the last webcast, I said, even the devil believes in Satan. I, what I meant to say was, even <laughs> yes. the devil believes in Jesus, but he's not saved. 
Yeah. And so, if we say anything ridiculous, please, please give us the benefit of the doubt and assume yes. it was a slip up because this is not scripted. <laughs> That's right. Just put it in the comments. And I'm sure and I mess up a lot more than you do, Mark. Get, go mock away. Just mock us. Mock, go, yeah, just mock go us. Go on, mock yeah, us. We, but, okay. but the point is that it, to believe in Jesus, St. Paul or St. James rather said, your, your faith has to be followed by works. So if you have no works, if there's no sign and evidence of your faith in Christ, which is A, repentance, and B, which is love in action, your faith is dead. And then no, you should not presume that you are avoiding, as it says here, the wrath of God, which is really, it sounds scary, but what that really is, is just God saying, justice just demands that you refused me, who I'm your creator. So, okay, let's keep moving forward. There's a beautiful quote here. I think Father Michel Rodrigue from Quebec, uh, a a French mystic, has really summarized this quite beautifully, Daniel, and go ahead and read that. So he says, the refuge, first of all, is you. Before it is a place, it is a person, a person living with the Holy Spirit in a state of grace. A refuge begins with the person who has committed her soul, her body, her being, her morality, according to the word of the Lord, the teachings of the church, the law of the Ten Commandments. So we just want to emphasize this whole concept of spiritual refuge. Um, and we're, we're going to talk here about physical refuges here in a moment, but the the most important thing is to understand the spiritual aspect. In fact, I think we have some other quotes, Daniel, that show how the spiritual actually flows into the physical. So if you are being... Now, we used an example the other day on another webcast. The priests who were praying in Hiroshima before the atomic bomb dropped, they were in a house near the epicenter, and everything around them was devastated. Hundreds, you know, thousands and thousands died. These priests were unscathed. Even the church was destroyed, but the house they were living in was preserved. And this is what they said. Now, keep in mind what I just said earlier, that my immaculate heart, she said, is your refuge, the way that leads you to God. And at Fatima, she called us to pray the rosary. So these priests were praying the rosary. And they said, we have no explanation other than this. We were living the message of Fatima, and that's why God protected us. To their end days, Daniel, they did And he protected them in the middle of a nuclear blast. That's right. God can can protect you anywhere, even if there's no physical refuges, and we think there will be, but even if there's no physical refuges, or even if you're not taken to one, no stress. God is absolutely in charge. As I said, he's not new to this idea of protecting his people when that's called for. He can protect you wherever you are if you trust in him and if that and if it is his will that you remain on earth for a little while longer. Uh, I love this little passage. Can I share a, a quick quote from St. Faustina? Well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm allowed. Oh, <laughs> that, that, that's approved enough for you, Mark. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I hope I have the right citation here, it, section it, I have 1731. To, I have to last because, you know, Daniel's always asking me permission in these webcasts. Hey, Mark, do, can I do this? No, I just, I trust that we you've got the outline here. in your head a little better than I do is all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, maybe because I'm pushing it, buttons here it, and I haven't If you let me talk, I'll just go on and start <laughs> philosophizing and then hours will disappear and then I'll, and then, yeah. So and I can't even see the people snoring in front of me like I can in class, so I won't know when to stop. <laughs> so Daniel is going to share right now from the Diary of St. Faustina, and she's the one, by the way, who gave us the beautiful messages of divine mercy. And this is just a, the pivotal message. I, yeah. I believe, salvation and sanctification, this mm-hmm. is one of the key messages for our time. And this isn't a huge deal, this particular passage, but it points out that, yes, physical protection is also often God's will. We can't presume it is in any given case, but in general, yes, he wants to protect his faithful even physically. So Faustina wrote, I was awakened by a great storm. The wind was raging, and it was raining in torrents, thunderbolts striking again and again. I began to pray that the storm would do no harm. When I heard the words, and these are the words of Jesus she's hearing, say the chaplet I have taught you, and the storm will cease. I began immediately to say the chaplet and hadn't even finished it when the storm suddenly ceased. I heard the words, through the chaplet, you will obtain everything if what you ask is compatible with my will. So this storm was all out torrential. And before she even finished the chaplet, and by the way, it's a seven minute prayer. So maybe she was just three minutes in for all we know. And then the storm suddenly ceased because God wants to protect us, but he wants it 
he wants that protection also. He wants us to cooperate. He wants us to cooperate in everything we can. And he wants us to cooperate in that protection. So seeking out that protection spir is, uh, uh, spiritually is our most important uh, aspect of preparation here. Not about storing up a bunch right. of food. Look, there is nothing you can do physically to keep you safe from the Antichrist. <laughs> he, if you're going to be safe in what's coming, it's because of God's intervention. So we do, we pray the chaplet, the rosary, consecrate right. ourselves to the Holy Family, remain in a state of grace, frequent the sacraments, trust in the divine mercy, strive to live in the divine will. You do those things, you are already in the only refuge that matters. <laughs> This is a good point to transition, speaking of the storm, to Father Stefano Gobi's messages. He was the head of the Marian Movement of Priests, a movement that spread all over the entire world. Uh, cardinals, bishops, and priests joined it. Um, you know, Father Stefano Gobi, just as a side note, you know, he his writings kind of pointed towards the end, toward the new millennium, around the end of 1998-2000. And, you know, he was either A, wrong, <laughs> B, uh, the Lord has delayed it, or see there was another meaning behind it. And so it doesn't discount everything he wrote. In fact, his writings have the imprimatur, and I personally find them some of the most sublime private revelations out there. And yeah, in I think they're quite clearly authentic to anyone who reads them with an open mind. Oh, well, we're living them right now. If you read them right now, you'll see that they, they, uh, they're coming true as we speak, and uh, mm. that perhaps more than anything else is a sign, but to uh, Our Lady of, uh, uh, sorry, to Father Gobi, Our Lady said, "My Immaculate Heart, it is your safest refuge, and the means of salvation which at this time God gives to the Church and to humanity. Whoever does not enter into this refuge will be carried away by the great tempest, which has already ready begun to rage." She says elsewhere, "It is the refuge which your Heavenly Mother has prepared for you." my heart. Here you will be safe from every danger, and at the moment of the storm, you will find your peace. I mean, these are amazing messages. Once again, you have another seer speaking of a great hurricane. By the way, when I got that word from the Lord that there was a great storm coming like a hurricane, I hadn't read these messages. So when I saw the word storm, my eyes kind of popped. But maybe one more, one more from Father Stefano, because there's such powerful messages. It says, our Lady says that in these times, now I just pop, see this is what happens when I'm, I'm doing everything here technically, but it says, in these times you all need to hasten to take shelter in the refuge of my immaculate heart, because grave threats of evil are hanging over you. These are first of all evils of a spiritual order which can harm the supernatural life of your souls. And then she says, there are evils of a physical order, such as infirmity, disasters, accidents, droughts, earthquakes, and incurable diseases, which are spreading about. There are evils of a social order. And now she says this, and I want to point this out, and this is our transition maybe to talking about physical refuges. She says to be protected from all these evils, the physical, spiritual, and social I invite you to place yourselves under shelter in the safe refuge of my Immaculate Heart. She can protect you from everything. Mm -hmm. She's not God. She's nothing compared to Jesus. She's a creature. He's the creator. But Jesus has given her all grace. All, all of his power he has freely given over to her because she is the mediatrix of all grace. There is nothing she cannot do through her son and she is nothing there's nothing that she cannot do for you so you need to never doubt that you need to always fly to her protection she'll never fail you she'll never fail you speaking of flying in the book of revelation chapter 12 prior to the antichrist rising from the sea or at about the same time roughly that it says in revelation chapter 12 i don't have it queued up in front of me but it says that this woman our lady is battling with the dragon and as we said in the last webcast, St. Michael the Archangel appears. He casts Satan out of this domain over the earth, the heavens or the air, as St. Paul calls them. Satan loses some power during this time, what we call the warning, the sixth seal. But then he takes that power and he concentrates it in chapter 13 into the beast, into the Antichrist. 
But it says in Revelation chapter 12 that the woman whom this dragon is pursuing, which is both a symbol of the people of God and the church and Our Lady, he says he's pursuing her, but she was given two wings like that of a great eagle, and she was taken into the desert and given a place of refuge. And so Our Lady, I mean, that whole scripture is a symbol of God really giving the church protection. And there's no reason, Daniel, there's no logical reason to think that God wouldn't give safety to his people during the time of Antichrist, because we know right. he will be dominating everything. He's going to have worldwide dominion. We know that from scripture. So... We also know that the Arab peace will follow him. Yes, we know that. That is the unanimous consensus of, of, of private revelation. We have a glorious era of peace coming. And how do we connect these two time periods? Well, clearly, uh, the faithful need to be preserved. We don't know exactly the number, of course, but some uh, large enough amount of the faithful need to be preserved through this reign to the time of the era. The era does not exist so that plants and animals can flourish. That all exists for the sake of man. All of that was made for us. Don't, don't, uh, can, don't be confused by the environmentalists who say that we should just get rid of humans so that plants and animals can flourish. No, it's all made for us. So we need to, uh, a, a, a large group needs to, needs to be there at the dawn of the era to repopulate the earth. So if God is going to preserve a group of faithful, why not do it? in the same way that we read of in the book of Acts. Why not do it through Christian communities? So Why that we can that be all the best be way? basket cases. That's right. Exactly. We're going to be basket cases together. <laughs> so we're all in these big baskets and we're just basket cases together for the, it's it what we're going to be tempted to be during the reign of the Antichrist, but we will be protected completely. Miraculous. That's right. Remember, you, this is such great news because you don't have to worry about storing up a bunch of guns so that you can fight the Antichrist because you can't. That's right. But you can be miraculously protected. The, we are referring to this webcast as the Time of Refuges, and you can see on your screen there, there is the tab now after the seventh seal of the Time of Refuges. And, you know, this last part of the, the, the graphic, we're not, this isn't necessarily all chronological in the sense that it's A follows B follows C, because the time of refuges could even be right now, brothers and sisters, as COVID-19 spreads around the world. Um, I think we actually have a quote, don't we, Daniel, from one of the seers speaking about right where you are is a refuge. Yeah. Let me uh, let me find it. So this is also actually from Luz de Maria, and this is July 17th, 2016 which is also part of the volumes that bear the imprimatur. Um, she says, your homes are permanent places of refuge for our hearts, if in them divine love dwells. If you are messengers of peace and fruits of unity and fraternity, being witnesses and testimony of uh, being witnesses and test testifying to the faith, testifying to hope and of love of your neighbor, remaining in a state of grace, permanent vigil to ensure you come to possess this state of grace at least not only for you but so that you are able to give yourselves to others in a single heart that of my son i'm sorry i had that in a low font i misread a couple things but that's the gist of it is that your homes already are refuges if you're striving your best to respond to heaven's messages now the state of grace is the foundation for all of these things which of course itself re means repenting of your sins and bringing them to confession but then from that foundation of a state of grace, you are building this refuge in the hearts of Jesus and Mary in your homes already. So yes, don't compartmentalize everything. Don't over-linearize it. There's plenty of overlap and the refuges are already a reality in a sense. Before we go any further, and we're going to share with you some quotes, some more quotes from different various seers who are very credible or even who have a certain amount of approval from their bishops. This is a good point, Daniel, I think, to get our perspective back again. The whole purpose of our life right now is heaven. That's our goal. In fact, Our Lady said to Pedro Regis, she said, heaven is your goal. Make sure you know that heaven is your goal. Um, to put some perspective on this, because we know that when people are asking about refuges and so on, they're asking this out of fear. Out you know, of fear. I have to laugh because I was thinking out today about a conference I was at with um, Dr. Ralph Martin. And he said, I'm not afraid to be a martyr. He said, it's the part of how you get to be a martyr. He says, that we all in our mm. human nature, you know, we're scared of. So 
I know the question behind refuges is, am I going to be safe? Are my kids going to be safe? Right. Are my grandchildren going to be safe? But, you know, here's something I'm going to throw a little stick into your, your spokes right now. Please do. I this, think I know it's coming. Yeah, this is from St. Therese de Lisieux from her autobiography. And she says this. Now, get a load of this, folks. My heart thrills at the thought of the frightful tortures Christians are to suffer at the time of Antichrist, and I long to undergo them. Now, you have to understand the context of this, what she's just saying right now. She is speaking about her willingness, her desire to suffer anything for Jesus and for the sake of souls. And what you are hearing right there is the words of love. She loves Jesus so much that she wants to join her sufferings to him. And of course, this is right from scripture itself where St. Paul says, I make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. So because we're the mystical body of Jesus, we participate as his mystical body in sharing in his sufferings. Now, the sufferings that I or you would share, Daniel, or our viewers is maybe just one drop of the passion of Christ, but yet our Lord in his goodness brings meaning to our suffering. So the whole idea of euthanization and assisted suicide is so contrary to the gospels. It is so contrary to what our Lord wants. And those of you who are watching, who maybe are sick right now, who are tempted, who are despairing right now and thinking, you know what, I I, I have no doubt somebody's watching right now who's contemplating taking your life. And we want you to know you can join your suffering to Jesus to help save souls. It and is said that that is the one thing that mm -hmm. the angels envy us for, is our ability to suffer for Christ. And Jesus is constantly telling the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, that if you're living, if you're striving to live in the divine will, that Jesus can take even more pleasure in you than a saint in heaven, because you can still have the holiness of his will, but you can still suffer and offer it up to him. So whatever circum, you know, whatever circumstances are outside of your control, that means they're God's will for you. And how glorious it is to be given the greatest gift, this gift of suffering, because we can, we can fuse it with the suffering of Jesus in the passion. I mean, it can be infinitely meritorious. It's the best thing you can do is to suffer redemptively. It's a gift. So don't ask in fear. Am I going to be okay? A am I am I going to be shielded from every little thing that could possibly happen to me in some nice little house somewhere that I'll be able to? Don't don't ask those foolish questions. We yes, we we don't. You know, Mark and I. It's above our pay grade to go making specific promises to specific people. What matters is what God's will for you is. In general, we believe it's fair to say mm -hmm. that God wishes to preserve a remnant for the era. Yes. Daniel, it come, just what you said, it comes down to God's will. What is his will for me? And Jesus said, his will is my food. In fact, in the stunning uh, meditations to Louisa Picaretta, servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, Jesus explains during his passion how he was asking for more and more and right. more sufferings from the Father so he could save at least, save at least the ones that he knew. In fact, who wouldn't accept him and he the the understanding in the garden of gethsemane he says that his passion his sorrow in the garden it wasn't because he was facing these punish or these sufferings and these tortures it was that despite all this many would still refuse him and right. that's that he was so saying, Lord, take that cup away take that, that cup is away so this is unbearable because yes. <laughs> i think a lot of people try me. to yeah i think a lot of people try to justify they're being afraid of pain by saying even Jesus was afraid of pain in the garden. He was not. He was not afraid of pain. He wanted to suffer as much as possible, not because he was sadistic, but because he knew that through sufferings, he could attain the salvation of souls. He was crying out during uh, on the cross. He was crying out for more sufferings. When he said, I thirst, we know that he was thirsting for souls mm -hmm. when he said that, not for water. But, and of course he was thirsty, but that he wasn't concerned about that. He was thirsting for souls, but even more specifically, how was it that he was saving souls? Through pain. So when he said, I thirst, he was thirsting for more pain. Right. Daniel, in the Don't book, be afraid of pain. Yeah, yeah. Because as we've said in previous webcasts, the Lord will give us the grace that we need when right. 
we need it. And exactly. we could go on and on, and we're not, we've already done that in a previous webcast, about how God provided the martyrs in the moment when they needed it, extraordinary graces to bear the most unbearable pains. Mm. But maybe we'll just, before we move on to explaining some of the seers, uh, quoting them rather, their words on physical refuges, I want to just read to you right now from Second Corinthians chapter 13, and listen to what St. Paul says, because maybe some of you are feeling weak right now. And you're feeling, I can't, I can't face this. I'm, I'm already terrified. And the whole idea of global communism, of an antichrist, of them pursuing me, and that, that kind of thing. I mean, these are, the, it's yeah, sure, it's the stuff of nightmares. But if you don't have faith, but if you have faith, it shouldn't be. And Saint Paul says this about his own sense of weakness. He says, my, Jesus said to him, "My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect." in weakness. Now listen to what St. Paul says. I will all the more gladly then boast of my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So you know what St. Paul is saying here is, hey, Lord, I I want to be delivered from my weakness right now, But if this is your will, forget it. I'm on board with you. I will suffer. I will bear this, even calamities, he said, if that's what your divine will orders up for me, because your will is my food. And it is always for the best. And Jesus even tells Louisa that those who trust in him, those who are striving to live in the divine will, they look at the storm and it just makes them even more courageous. They see a storm coming, it just makes them even, it almost excited. Why be excited at a coming storm? Because Jesus, and I don't have the quote in front of me, so I'm paraphrasing. Jesus tells Louisa that those who trust in him, they look at the storm and they see it as an opportunity to be washed. Mm -hmm. It is an opportunity to be washed even cleaner than you are now. And boy, do we all need to be washed. I I need to be washed. Uh, And so I... (laughs) Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I can smell you all the way from here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> smell me from Canada, probably. Canada, yeah. I'm sweating like a pig here. It's I was wondering what that was tonight. <laughs> but uh, so we need to be washed. And look, unless there's anybody perfect watching this, in which case you can just turn it off right now. For the rest of us, we See need you. to be washed. <laughs> and yeah, so Mark, get out of here. But, <laughs> yeah. but but a little bit of a little some some chastisements are going to help us to become the saints that we know that we've known for years that we were called to be and that right. we haven't found the strength to become. What's coming upon the world is going to give you that strength mm-hmm. because the grace will increase in proportion to the trials in front of you. And so much so that it might even seem easy. And let's face it, all of us, you know, I mean, you look at the scourge of abortion today, 115,000 babies aborted every day. And we look at what all of us have done to stop it. And I could look at my own conscience and say, you know, I've written articles about it, I've talked about it, but, you know, have I really done enough or done enough? There's a thousand things in injustices in the world. Um, Have I really been bold in proclaiming Jesus Christ? Have I been bold with the gospel or have I been ashamed? I mean, there's there's a thousand things, Daniel, that really we need that reparation and we can look at this storm as, hey, you know, like someone was saying, hey, these masks, yeah, you know what? you know, I may or may not agree with the masks and having to wear them, but you know what, I'm going to put it on as a reparation, you know, maybe for the sins of my tongue. And I thought, you know, it was really wise that someone said that. Uh, Everything that we're going to go through, whether it's just or unjust, whether this quarantining and all these things, whether you agree with it or not, or you feel it's ridiculous or demonic or whatever, we can still take these things and bear them and and offer them up as reparation, just as Jesus, who was pure and innocent and was crucified, offered up everything that everything he suffered was unjust by definition he was the just one yeah. so imitate look, him. your yeah imi- your anger is not going to fix the world because the world is going down mm-hmm. it's, it's going down what no matter how much activism you can throw at it and no matter how much anger you can throw at it so and i'm not saying be a quietist you know we we of course have to do our part to, to try and make the world a better place don't get me wrong but be aware of the fact that you're not going to fix the world, that the, it's just going to get more and more corrupt until God comes to fix it. So that will help you to be to be more resigned to what God wills for you to suffer and to suffer it with abnegation and union with his suffering. And what you do, you are in the refuge of his sacred heart if that's how you approach the cross. St. Paul, yeah, Saint Paul VI, uh, who was a pope, said 
that there has to be a small flock subsisting. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing it a bit, but he said there has to be at yeah, some yeah. point. Go ahead, Dan. Did you remember the Yeah, quote? it was, well, it was uh, the, the flock must subsist no matter how small. Some flock must re always remain. And we, of course, know that that's the case. The, it, but that has been promised to us. The church will never die. Right. And the church is going to rise again after mm -hmm. these chastisements. So how, so are we ready to get to a few more prophecies well, on yeah. the refugees themselves? No, that, that's, yeah, that's that's the, um, the, the wonderful transition there. That's uh, the segue. I, I detected the segue. it. Okay. We've <laughs> just so. done a segue. State it, <laughs> the segue brought to you in part by... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to read um, from Jennifer. She's one of the Please seers on our website at countdowntothekingdom.com. And Jennifer says this, the time is, sorry, Jesus says this to Jennifer, the time is coming soon. It is rapidly approaching for my places of refuge are in the stage of being prepared at the hands of my faithful. My people, my angels will come and guide you to your places of refuge where you will be sheltered from the storms and the forces of the Antichrist in this one world government. Be prepared, my people, for when my angels come, you do not want to turn away. You will be given one opportunity when this hour comes to trust in me and my will for you. For that is why I have told you to begin to take heed now. Begin to prepare today, for in what appears to be days of calmness, darkness lingers. Well, that was 2004, and now we are starting to see the storm winds whip up. How much more should we be prepared? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we're, we're past the days of calm, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because now we're at the days where everyone, even in the secular world, realizes, I think, in their more honest moments at least, mm -hmm. that nothing will ever be the same again. You read something from, I think it was called The Week. Do you have that in the front week, of you? The Week, and I, I, I don't think I... I, I have the quote right in front of me. I might be able to cue it up if I try, but I can remember the gist. It was a secular writer, mainstream publication, mm -hmm. The Week. He said, I know that we seem to be in the upswing from coronavirus and uh, things maybe seem to be starting to get back to normal with all these protests, but I have this deep sense, in the, and I'm paraphrasing, but in the pit of my heart mm -hmm. that says that we are just fiddling around with minutia right now, waiting for some huge thing to hit that's yeah. the sense that even mm -hmm. secular people who know nothing of prophecy have mm -hmm. and that's what jesus said to louisa that people are mm -hmm. tired of this present era sad and bloody they realize that it's nearing an end but they don't know what's coming which is why they're despairing they don't realize that god through these chastisements is preparing a glorious era of peace unlike any in history so we uh, we need to proclaim this message to give people hope and that's that's why i named my my small book after it, The Crown of History and the Glorious Era of Universal Peace. This We need to have hope for what's coming in order to get through uh, what's now in front of us. Yeah. A couple other quotes, though, on these yeah, um, on these I just refuges. want to butt in there, though, and be Please totally do. rude. Um, <laughs> and I just want to say that, you know, uh, this is a good point just to say right now that we are getting letters from people all over the world. And, I'm, you know, it's amazing. People are coming back to church. People are saying, I'm beginning to pray again. I'm going back to confession, mass. There are massive conversions happening from the letters we're receiving. And so I, I want to, we're sharing that not, with you, not because Daniel and I have something to boast about. I mean, we're, we're with St. Paul here, Lord, in our weakness. You are strong because we, we feel like a couple of, of uh, you know, Couple of nutters, as they say. If I if I say anything good, it's just because I quoted Jesus. That's so. Please give him all the credit. But you know, it's it's what we're what we're saying is people are waking up, and uh, right. so this whole idea now of refuge is what we're speaking about. Well, we we want you to understand that God has provision for you. So we know that some of you were shaken, and you have no reason not to think that God won't preserve you in some way physically, spiritually, because as we know, and Daniel, I just got to flip to it really quick right now. I don't know if I can find it. But in the book of Revelation, it says that the beast, yeah, here it is, uh, chapter 13, verse 9. He's talking about the Antichrist and how the Antichrist, this beast, is commanding everybody, everybody to follow him and that they have to take this mark and so on. And it says in 13, chapter 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone slays with the sword, 
with the sword he must be slain. And then it says, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. I'll tell you right now, that scripture, that is proof right there that there is no pre-tribulation rapture because St. John is saying, some of you will go off to captivity, some of you will be slain and martyred, and this is a call now for the endurance of the saints. Why would we need endurance if we're raptured right. up into heaven, right? Exactly. No need for endurance up there. We're all, we're all fine and dandy, yeah. So certainly we are going to be on earth. Uh, some will be martyred. That is the greatest gift of all immediate admittance into heaven. So be thankful if God calls you that. Others will be protected in refuges. And we see, you know, I quoted Luz de Maria earlier, but actually uh, where she was saying that your homes are already refuges if you're living my, my teachings. But the paragraph before that in the July 17th, 2016 message says, Beloved children, each one of you is a refuge from my son. So this is Our Lady speaking to Luz de Maria. For me and for yourself, you must know places of refuges exist where you can protect yourselves. In the instant I point out to you, created by some of my children, some places of refuge are large to accommodate many of you. Others are not so large. Others are familial places of refuge. You must not enter in search of these or feel bad because you do not form part of a group conformed for the aim of this protection. You possess the protection within you by working and acting like my son works and acts. So there's so much in that paragraph. Don't go searching them out. Don't go building, trying to build one if God hasn't incredibly clearly called you to do that. Just know that they're there. And when the time comes, mm -hmm. you will be miraculously led to them. We are Dave, completely trusting and we are relying on miracles mm -hmm. and what's coming. So that's fine. David says in the Psalms, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And so, brothers and sisters, if you, you know, it's not a headlight. God isn't projecting into the future. It doesn't say that God is a lighthouse. His word is a lamp unto my feet. And so it's just enough light for your feet, just enough light to see the step forward. So listen, if you're living in the divine will, if you're following the Lord carefully, that means you're going to be walking every step and you will see the intersection when it comes because you're already walking. You're walking by that light by your feet and you'll see it. And so... Yeah. If God says to you at that moment, I'm going to take you to a refuge, then he'll take you to a refuge. You're not going to miss it. In fact, don't Daniel, worry about the details. He will he will lead you there. You don't what, need to have the, 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 the huge light. You've got the lamp mm -hmm. to your feet. That's right. I'm sorry I was butting in there again. So Dr. No, I did. That's all right. You know, for <laughs> Canadian, I'm just far too rude. Um, <laughs> Father Michel, again, we want to turn to Father Michel because Jennifer's not alone in this whole idea of... of um, physical refuges and the angels coming. She's never met Father Michel. They've never heard of each other as far as I know. But Father Michel in one of his messages says, you will see a little flame appear in front of you if you are called to go to a refuge. So this is at the, the time of the refuges, I guess is, is what we we're calling it. And that's what's on our tab. But he says, this will be your guardian angel who shows this flame to you. And your guardian angel will advise you and guide you. In front of your eyes, you will see a flame that will guide you where to go. Follow this flame of love. He will conduct you to a refuge from the Father. If your home is a refuge, he will guide you by this flame through your home. If you must move to another place, he will guide you along the road that leads there. Whether your refuge will be a permanent one or a temporary one before moving to a bigger one will be for the Father to decide. And so there you have Father Michel again saying very similar to what Jennifer said. And I don't find anything strange about this because Jesus led, or rather God the Father led the Israelites in the desert through a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Uh, right. We've seen stranger things in in, in Christendom throughout the, the last two yeah. centuries. Uh, your guardian has every your guardian angel has every right to appear to you and lead you somewhere. Uh, there were some attacks recently against Father Michel. So this is unprecedented. This is nonsense. How can he say drop everything after the warning and leave your family? He's not saying that. He's saying if your guardian angel miraculously appears to you, follow it. That's pretty sound advice, I'd say. And uh, you don't have to stress about the details. Your guardian angel's a lot smarter than you. And he's got it figured out how to lead you to whatever refuge it be God's will for you to be in. So we've got Jennifer saying this. We've got Father Michel saying this. We see all sorts of scriptural precedent for this idea of God protecting people in a refuge. Um, the, um, also, I just, 
want to reiterate that Luz de Maria's approved revelations here with the imprimatur speak very clearly of it repeatedly, not just, I, I quoted the July 2016 right. one. We also have August 2016, where she was told, continue without being afraid and prepare, even if they say that you do not know what you are doing. Keep supplies in place, specially prepared to be my refugees. I will bring you from one place to another and will protect you. So it, this message is acknowledging that people will say, you don't know what you're doing. You have no idea what this, uh, uh, how you're going to get to a refuge. We don't need to have any idea. Mm -hmm. God is going to take care of that. I want to take a moment now to turn to a church father because we've dealt with private revelation thus so far. But they, And we have given you some scriptures today already referring to uh, these physical refuges that God has given his people over time. But I want to also now turn to a church father because this idea of refuges or what he calls solitudes also appears. And this also, you know, we, we, we want to talk about when. When do these refuges occur? If you look at our timeline, you know, we're indicating according to the seers, according to scripture, according to what St. John said, when the woman is given two wings to fly, it seems to be at the very beginning of the reign of the Antichrist. And so that's why you see this on our timeline. We're just following. But there's another indicator from Lactantius, and this is a powerful word, Daniel, of when this... Now, folks, I just want to say this webcast is going a little bit longer than usual, but I have a feeling people are pretty riveted to what is being said here. And I, I just want to reflect on Lactanius for a moment. Because, we still got a couple minutes before we hit the hour mark. All right, man. I think we can squeeze it in. He says that when will these refuges come? He says that will be the time in which righteousness shall be cast out and innocence be hated. I mean, just stop and think about how modesty has been thrown out, how purity is mocked. He says it'll be the time in which the wicked shall prey upon the good as enemies. I mean, we're seeing this right now, how that which is good is now evil. That which is evil has been turned into good. Family, marriage, these are all considered enemies. And he says, neither law nor order nor military discipline shall be preserved. Now we look at what's happening with the law, how the law is being overturned. Supreme courts and judges are overturning the natural law. He says there will be no order. Look what's happening in the streets in Europe and, and in America. Look at the violence happening in Nigeria and other countries, Syria and so on. And then he says military discipline shall, be pres shall not be preserved. You know, we're seeing this new principle now of preemptive strikes. So if you think another neighboring nation is going to attack you, you can take a preemptive strike on them. It's like your neighbor knowing he has a gun and he doesn't like you, going over and shooting him because you think that he might shoot you first. So, I mean, Lactantius, you're giving a powerful picture, and he goes on to say, All things shall be confounded and mixed together against right and against the laws of nature. Thus shall the earth be laid waste, as though by one common robbery. And I just did an article on communism and how global communism is coming, which is really, that's what communism does. It robs us. And he says there will be one common robbery. And when these things shall so happen, then the righteous and the followers of truth shall separate themselves from the wicked and flee into solitudes. Wow. There it well, is, right in a church father. Right from a church and, father. I mean, there's so many other sources that, that, that make clear that this time of refuges, this time of separation is coming. And look at all those signs Mark just read. You saw, you just see that playing out perfectly in the world today, like never before in history. So we're beyond the point of being able to deny that these events are at the door. They are at the door. And even though we don't have dates for you, we can say we are in the countdown. We, we are listening to the anthem before the game starts. So put your game face on. How? By getting into the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. That's what we should, that should be our closing exhortation here. Trust in the divine mercy. Consecrate yourself to Our Lady and the Holy Family. Live a life centered in the sacraments. Get to Mass as much as possible. Repent of your sins. Get to confession. You do these things. You are so ready for what's coming. In this storm, the safe harbor is divine mercy. It's the mercy of Jesus. And St. Francis de Sales, a 17th century bishop, said this, Do not fear what may happen tomorrow. The same loving Father who cares for you today will care for you tomorrow and every day. Either he will shield you from suffering 
or he will give you unfailing strength to bear it. Be at peace then and put aside all anxious thoughts and imaginings.